masks. They protect us. But they also do something else. They can hide our identity. And so, in these very challenging times, when we need people, and when we need God, we may put on the metaphorical mask to hide our need. And we close ourselves off receiving the blessings that come through friendship, through opening up our hearts and our lives to another person, to experiencing the fullness of love that comes through God unconditionally. And the masks that protect us can also prevent us from praying to the one who cares for us for allowing ourselves to be seen and fully known in the presence of our Creator. Allowing ourselves to be free in the provision of God's grace. You might be wondering alone right now and you might feel lost and you may be overcome with the feelings of despair know that God wants to give you his presence and that he sees you, you may be doing a good job of protecting yourself, of hiding, but God wants you to be authentic before him and know that your truest self is in the presence of the cross, is with Jesus. No matter how much you try and hide from God, he sees you and loves you behind the mask. I was wearing my mask the other day and I tried to take a sip of coffee. That doesn't work. But I'm a slow learner because I also tried to drink a milkshake just the other day with my mask on. If, you've, if that's happened to you, why don't you put in the comments, been there, done that. Okay, put in the comments, been there, done that. Like you forget you're wearing your mask and you try and do something. And then I was in the dental office getting my teeth cleaned during the COVID crisis, and I sincerely asked, do I need to take my mask off? I mean, how does that even work with your mask on, right? Doesn't. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, masks, we wear them to protect ourselves and others from spreading viruses and disease. But you can't eat or drink while you're wearing your mask, and you can't open wide your mouth for a dental cleaning. All right. In 2 Corinthians 6, Paul says in a way that the Corinth church was masking themselves. They were masking their hearts, that their hearts were being closed the, to uh, the Apostle Paul's pastoral guidance and his affection. And he encourages them to open wide their hearts. So your physical PPE masks may at times feel restrictive and you may feel like you're not as free. But even though you feel restricted and even though you might feel as free, wearing them is doing some good. All right. But your metaphorical mask, like the one in the Corinth church, the one that you use to armor yourself so that you can hide how you're feeling, you can hide how you're stressed, you can hide how you're not connecting, the one that you are wearing to protect your heart, the one that you're wearing so that you don't have to feel vulnerable, that mask, that mask is restrictive. And that mask is restricting your own affection to God and to one another. Now, behind every mask, listen to me, every person you see wearing a mask, both literal and metaphorical, is a person made by God whom he loves. And behind every mask, is a person longing for connection. So you may be feeling closed off. You might be feeling right now like you're small inside. But to have a wide open, spacious life with an abundance of joy and connection, you're going to have to open wide your heart. So listen to how Paul appeals to you and the Corinth church to open wide your heart. 
If it's your first time with us, we're so glad that you're watching. Thanks for being our first time guest. We stand at the reading of God's word. So wherever you are, stand up if you're willing and able. And I'll be reading aloud what's in white. If you can please read aloud what's in yellow. This is 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 13. The word of God for the people of God. Paul says, As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anybody's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, in hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. This is a reading from God's word to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. You may be seated. Hey, thanks for helping me read God's word. If you believe God's word, say amen. I believe in God's word. Church, and for all who are watching right now, I love you. I love you, Littleton Church. I love you. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I've been missing you. I've been missing seeing you face to face. And I want to tell you that when I'm preaching, what helps me is seeing you. <laughs> but right now, not being face to face with you, I have to imagine faces. I'm imagining you as I preach. And the reason I'm doing that is so that I can give you not only the gospel, but my life as well. And in giving you of my life, it means that I'm giving you my heart. And so I'm not always the best at it. I'm not. But I'm attempting to get better. It's a growing value in my life as a husband, as a father, as a preacher, a pastor, a teacher, and a friend. I want to give you not only God's truth, but I want to give you God's truth in me. I want to give you how God has been working in my life. And I want to give you the good and the bad. I'm going to tell you this this week, these past two weeks have been incredibly trying and incredibly difficult because my heart is in deep sorrow and in anguish and in pain. My heart hurts. My heart has been angered and sad and it's been in mourning. It's been in mourning over the wrongful deaths of Ahmad Arbery. And just this week over George Floyd as he was wrongfully killed by the knee of the Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin and others who assisted him. People who were hiding behind a badge. A man who's been given the responsibility to protect and serve, but did not protect and serve George Floyd. 
And in all of this pain and all of this suffering and this outrage and the violence that's occurring, what may be happening right now to some of you who are watching, to people in your household, to people in this community and others, is that hearts are beginning to close. And so I want to open up my heart and open up my story to you. You may have heard some of this before, but growing up in a biracial, multi-ethnic household in a small southern community, it taught me some things. One of the things it taught me to do was code switch. And you may not know what code switching is. You may know, some of you may know that code switching is if somebody's bilingual, they might switch between their native tongue and their second language. But in black and brown communities, we know code switching as being this. It's how to act to be acceptable. And I knew how to act to be acceptable to my white friends and another way to act to be acceptable to black and Latino friends. And I would change the way I expressed myself. So that's what it means to code switch. And one of the reasons that I would do that is to be acceptable. That's one of the reasons that people do it, to be accepted. But one of the side effects of that is that I become overly cautious of how I think people perceive me. And next is consciously thinking, who am I? And it can be exhausting and it can require a lot of energy to do that. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, maybe you can understand by thinking about it in this way, using this example. I remember when I was a kid and my sister had a friend over at the house and we were eating breakfast and he took his scrambled eggs and he mixed them with his grits, which is a very Southern thing to do. And I did likewise. I did the same. My sister said, I didn't know you liked to do that. And I said, I do it all the time. Wrong. I'd never done it before. Maybe you've done something similar. And at the very least, or at your best, it's kind of a way in which you can build rapport with somebody, kind of mirroring how they are. But at worst, you could lose yourself. I would take on something like that or I would hide something about myself. Because sometimes I would listen to people talk to me. Like one of my best friends when I was at his house and we're playing video games and he shared with me how he believed that people should marry within their own race, knowing good and well what my household looked like. And of course, then him offering the standard thing to me that I was exceptional or that I was different. You're different, Jovan. Or how a good friend could suddenly begin bullying me over my country of origin. And so whenever I wanted to be my true self, something would happen where I wouldn't choose to trust an open heart. But over the many years, I've learned to embrace my story, my origin story, and all the things about me. And it's, it's been my coming of age for whole Heartedness. My life has been building up for me through all of my experiences and the ways in which people have loved me. God has loved me and how, how God has given me a beloved community in my household with my wife and with my kids and with my church family. I've come to understand what wholeheartedness is like Brene Brown talks about. Brene Brown writes about being wholehearted in this way. She says, owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as spending our lives running from it. Embracing our vulnerabilities is risky, but not nearly as dangerous as giving up on love and belonging and joy. And the experiences that make us the most vulnerable. Only when we are brave enough to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. She writes this in Daring Greatly, how the courage to be vulnerable transforms the way we live, love, parent, and lead. It's by Dr. Brene Brown. And I believe this is what the Apostle Paul does in 2 Corinthians 6. He practices open-hearted ministry. And that's putting God's grace to good use, everybody. That God will grant repentance and salvation to those whose hearts are open wide. That they choose to see their stories with all the trouble and the sin and the hardships and all the grace 
and all the good stuff and they choose to open wide to God so that God can do something with their full story. See, Paul was confident in what God could do through his grace in him. That God's grace was sufficient in his weakness. When he was weak, he became strong because he relied on God. He was confident in the Lord, but he was also confident in himself, in the Lord, right? He was confident in what the Lord could do, but he was confident in himself and what the Lord could do through him. And so when he talked to the Corinth church about being reconciled to God through Jesus, he was sharing with them his life. And here's how he shared with them in this chapter. He begins by sharing his hardships. Did you catch that? He says, Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance and troubles, hardships and distresses, and beatings, imprisonments, and riots, and hard work, sleepless nights, and in hunger. His hardships he shared with them. And then he shared his graces. He said, in purity, and understanding, and patience, and in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God. So he shares his hardships, his graces, and he shares his ups and downs with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left through the glory and dishonor, bad report and good report. And then he shares with them his deliverance, how the Lord delivered him. Genuine yet regarded as imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. See, Paul was sharing with them what he was going through and how God was getting him through what he was going through and how God would get him all the way through, right? Paul is sharing with them his, the gospel and his life as well. And you may not know this, but today is Pentecost Sunday. It's the day the Holy Spirit rested on the hearts of believers and they spoke in other languages, the languages of all the people who had made pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Pentecost, for the, for the, for the, uh, for the, uh, the pilgrimage feast that they were at. It's the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit falls and many people are baptized. 3,000 people are baptized and it is the day of salvation. It's the birth of the church. Happy birthday, church. And so Paul, having this Holy Spirit believe that if he shares his whole story and people accept him, that they're also accepting Jesus. And if they deny him, they deny Jesus. Lean in real close. To deny a human of their humanity is to deny the one who created them. That's a closed heart. But open wide your heart to all people. And to deny the living testimony of the embodied believer is to deny the living God. That's a closed heart. But instead, have an open heart. Open wide your heart to the living testimony of God. Today is the day of salvation. Look, today's the day of salvation for you. If you are unable to open your heart wide to any people group, ethnicity, any person, if you can't open your heart wide, you're denying what God has created in his image. You're denying the truth of God and you're accepting a lie. And to deny the living testimony of the embodied believer is to deny the living God. You want to open your heart wide to the testimony of God. You want to accept those who are the children of God. See, Paul's authenticity is not in question here, but what is in question in his writing is the genuineness of the faith of the Corinthians. That's what's in question. And listen, lean in. We want to be authentic people here in this place, in this community, or wherever community you reside. You want to be authentic people, that you want to have a genuine faith that is open to the word of God and the testimony of believers and open to all people. Paul here is not writing about himself to be popular. No, he is relentless in his pursuit to portray God's power, not as the absence of pain or the presence of a miracle, but for God providing faithful endurance in the midst of adversity. 
And we're going through some stuff. And that's what's going to change us is our, our faith and how we interpret what we're going through. See, Paul shares with the people the good and the bad. Paul says, man, I'm not powerful because I've been protected from all these things. I'm powerful because of the presence of the Lord in me that is working through with endurance that I'm holding on because of the strength of the Lord. That adversity is what has shaped me and what is defining me. See, because Paul wants to share all that he's going through because he wants hearts that are closed to begin to open. And that's what we want for you. We want in this time of trouble, of racial violence, of racial prejudice, of racial injustice. We don't want your hearts to be closed off to people or closed off to God. It's an opportunity for our hearts to begin to open. See, Jesus was often, and today he is often misunderstood. He may not have been an open book, meaning easily understood, but he does have an open heart. And because he wasn't always easily understood, he faced opposition. But here's what he teaches his disciples, and here's what he teaches us, is that Jesus expected opposition from the world. According to Sean Palmer in his book, Unarmed Empire, he says Jesus expects opposition from the world and he equally expects his followers to respond to that opposition with vulnerability. Jesus realizes not everyone is willing to accept the peace that we extend. So we as people, when we are given opposition as followers of Jesus. Listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this is what Jesus teaches, that we then respond with removing the metaphorical mask. So we as people, as a church, can cultivate space for vulnerability so that people can experience connection. Here's how you can do that. I want to give you Five things that you can do. Number one, you can invite people to share their story. And when a person shares their story, here's what you must do. You must listen. Don't give your opinion. Don't give advice. Listen. And then pause. Pause so that you can honor what they have shared and hold space for what they have shared. And then here's two things that you can do once they've shared proactive things right here. You can say, I observe where I see God working in your life. I observe where I see God's working. So you observe and you tell them, this is how God, I see him working in your life. Observe where you see God working in their life. And then you can affirm their activity and courage in their story. So you're really listening and you're seeing where God was working. And then you affirm how they were working and the courage that they exhibited in their story. These are ways in which you can cultivate a vulnerable space so that a person can both you and a person have an open heart. Listen, who do you need to open wide your heart? Who do you need to open wide your heart today? And how will you choose to open wide your heart to God? How will you do that? Well, let me give you a way in which you can do that. I believe it begins with confession and repentance. It begins with confessing your sins to God and then turning away from those sins towards Him. Confession and repentance. In fact, I want to pray over us. And as I pray, I want you to confess to God and turn away from your sins. Will you do that with me? You can make that choice today to open your heart wide through confession and repentance. Let's pray. Holy Father, I pray for each person who is watching today and worshiping today, wherever they are, whatever today is, whether it's Sunday or Monday or Tuesday. Father, I pray that you would bless each person with the ability to open their heart wide. May they make themselves vulnerable to you. Right now, as you're listening, confess your sin to God. Ask him for forgiveness and then turn away from your sin. Say, I'm not going to live in that direction anymore. 
I'm going to make a 180. I'm turning to you, God, right now. Will you do that? Oh, Holy Father, I thank you so much for receiving all of the confessing and Father for allowing people's hearts to be shaped and changed, for them to change their mind and change the direction to turn to you. Thank you so much. Wow, Jesus is doing work in your life today. Listen, say in the comments this, in obedience to what we have talked about today, in obedience to God's word, say, I will have an open heart. I will have an open heart. And then also say this, okay? You want to have an open heart, but also say this. Commit to this. I will protect an open heart. That means I, I'm going to make myself vulnerable and I will protect people who make themselves vulnerable. Amen? All right, listen, that's what we're going to do. This is the type of people we're going to be and this is how we respond to difficult situations. We respond by not hiding, but revealing our authentic selves to God and one another. Hey, right now, I want you to put in the comments your prayers and your praises. Put your prayers and your praises in the comments so that we can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth.